Well, good morning, Yakima Foursquare Church. As said, my name is Jonathan Maravilla. I also go by Johnny. Um, and for those of you guys that do not know me, um, I'm just going to share a little bit about myself and who I am and how I ended up here. Sorry. <clears throat> So as said, I am a summer intern here at Yakima Foursquare Church. Uh, I am from Southern California. I go to Life Pacific University. I am a junior studying worship arts and media. And man, I'm just so thankful for the opportunity that I have to not only um, share, but the opportunity that I've had to be a part of this leadership, be a, be a part of this team and be a part of this community. Thank you guys for allowing us to be a part of this journey and just allowing us to just come and serve and just allow God to just move in our lives and just being able to serve you guys at, at its best. So with that, um, we're going to continue our series on the King. And I'm going to be on Mark chapter 6. And today's sermon is, there is power and provision in our belief. And there is power and provision in our obedience. So in this passage, we will uncover what Jesus does, what he calls his disciples to do, and who Jesus will reveal himself as. And before we get into this, and before we just get started, I just want to pray. I just want to allow the Lord to just have his way and just do what he does. So with that, Father, we thank you for today, Lord. We thank you for the opportunity, Lord, that we have to just come together, Lord, even in, 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 the, in the seat of our cars, Lord, just to come and worship together, Lord, and pray together, Lord, and just consistently seek your face every single Sunday, Father. We thank you for this time. And Father, I just pray, Lord, that the words that come out of my mouth, Father, may not be mine alone, Father, but they would be the ones that you are speaking in me and are speaking through me. Lord, you know me, Lord, you have this Sunday, you have this time, and we just give you all the thanks and all the glory in advance. In your holy name, we all pray and say, Amen. So, as we are in Mark chapter 6, we see that Jesus has just, I'm just going to give you a brief description of what's happening before we get into the actual passage. So Jesus has just returned from his previous mission. In other words, Mark chapter 5, which is what Pastor Jake talked about last week. And so here we see that Jesus returns to his hometown and he is accompanied by his disciples. And this is something that I want us to remember because this is important. This is a moment where Jesus is going to reveal himself and he's going to uncover what he does, what he causes disciples to do, but what his true nature is. So we come, so we come here and it says that Jesus has returned to his hometown accompanied by his disciples. So in verses 2 all the way to 13, we see Jesus begin to teach in the synagogue and all who drew near were amazed at his teachings. They questioned him, but they also took offense at who he is. And with that, Jesus' response is, he was amazed at their unbelief that all he could do there was lay his hands on a few sick people and move on to the next site, move on to the next village, move on to the next mission. And, in, and we also uncover right on verse 7 to about 13, we see Jesus sends out the 12, okay? And he sends them out with two things. His authority to drive out impure spirits and careful instructions. And with that, we get to see not only that they drive out impure spirits, but they get to anoint people with oil and heal them. So they've been, they've been sent under God's authority. They've been sent under God's provision. And we get to see and we get to read that the disciples not only drove out impure spirits, but they also healed the sick. So then we're here on Mark chapter 6, verses 30 through 44. The disciples have just returned from their mission. And they come and they share with Jesus what they've done, what they've taught, and, 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 their, and their experience. So we're going to be on Mark chapter 6, verses 30 through 44. And it says, The apostles gathered around Jesus and reported to him all they had done and taught. Then... Because so many people were coming and going that they did not even have a chance to eat. He said to them, come with me by yourselves to a quiet place and get some rest. So they went away by themselves into a boat to a solitary place. But many who saw them leaving recognized them and ran on foot from all the towns and got there ahead of them. When Jesus landed and saw a large crowd, 
he had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. So he began teaching them many, many things. By this time, it was late in the day, so his disciples came to him. This is a remote place, they said, and it's already very late. Send the people away so that they can go to the surrounding countryside and villages and buy themselves something to eat. But he answered, you give them something to eat. They said to him, that would take more than half a year's wages. Are we to go and spend that much on bread and give it to them to eat? How many loaves do you have? He asked. Go and see. When they found out, they said five and two fish. Then Jesus directed them to have all the people sit down in groups on the green grass. So they sat down in groups of hundreds and fifties, taking the five loaves and the two fish and looking up to the heaven. He gave thanks and broke the loaves. Then he gave them to his disciples to distribute to the people. He also divided the two fish among them all. They all ate and were satisfied. And the disciples picked up 12 baskets full of broken pieces of bread and fish. The number of men who had eaten was 5,000. So let's just get a brief description here. Let's just get a, let's just kind of uncrack what's happening. So the disciples have just come back from their previous mission. Jesus, Jesus says, come with me and we're going to go to a quiet place to find some rest. And as they're leaving, the disciples, I mean, not the disciples, the people recognize Jesus and his disciples and they begin to follow him on foot. And not only do they follow them on foot, but they actually get to the destination even before Jesus and his disciples do. Even before they show up, they're already there knowing they're going to be there, knowing they're going to show up, and they're just there waiting for them. And I love this because as, as Jesus and his disciples are approaching that destination, Jesus sees them, he recognizes them, and he has compassion on them. And he says, and the Bible says, for they're like sheep without a shepherd. So he begins to teach them many things. So then Jesus continues to teach. He continues to teach these people many, many things. And then he's approached by one of his disciples and they say to him, yo, bro, these people have been here for a certain amount of time. It's already getting late. We're all super hungry. Send them away to go and just figure, figure out something to eat. Just tell them to go and do that. And then Jesus' response to them is, you give them something to eat. What? You give them something to eat. And I want to pause for a moment because I just want to share something. And this is, and this is a, a key point. So something that we've been doing through this internship is every single Thursday, an intern is scheduled to lead the group in a group devotional. So we've been going through the book of John. We've been uncracking who God is, who God says we are, and what do we do with this? So as I said, every Thursday an intern is scheduled to, to lead us in, in a group devotional. And the first time I was up to lead us in a group devotional, I was on John chapter 6, verses 1 through 24. And sure enough, the passage was on Jesus feeding the 5,000. So in this time, we, we take a moment to read the word, to just r- journal what God is speaking to us. And then we take a moment to share with each other. And in, in that time of observations, uh, my good friend Andres, who's also a summer intern here, we're just, in, we're just sharing our observations. And he, and he says something that is so interesting, but it also challenges us to really think outside of the box, outside of the picture. So he said, you know what I noticed? Jesus isn't really teaching them anything. He's just feeding them. And then we all look at each other and we're like, hmm. Whoa. He says, Jesus isn't really teaching them anything. He's just feeding them. And because this was a safe place to just share what we observed and what stood out to us, I wasn't 100% sure with this. But then I said, could it be, just could it be that the teaching was in the feeding? Could it be that Jesus was going to not only reveal something, but he was going to reveal who he is in this passage through the feeding? And like I said, though I wasn't 100% sure, I come across Mark chapter 6. And immediately, do you remember when I told us to remember that, the, the, that Jesus was accompanied by his disciples when he approached his hometown? Well, here's the reality. Jesus intentionally brought his disciples along with him because he was going to teach them something. 
Not only, they, not only were they able to see and witness Jesus be rejected in his hometown, but they were, also be, they were also able to see and witness the authority and the power that Jesus has and the, and the same authority and power that he gives us to drive out impure spirits and heal sick people. Jesus is going to teach them something in this journey, in this process. And here's the first thing that Jesus is teaching his disciples. Number one, God is the provider. You see, God knows our needs. He knows what we don't know. And he for sure provides what we cannot afford. He for sure provides what we cannot afford. God is the provider. He knows that the people are going to be hungry. He knows that there's a need and he knows that the people don't know how this is going to happen. <laughs> but he provides what the disciples thought they couldn't afford. Number two, the disciples had not yet learned this, but we'll learn that nothing is impossible for Jesus. There's nothing too high, there's nothing too wide and too big that can limit who Jesus is and what he wants to do. And it's so funny because Jesus carefully chose this specific time, this specific place and knew who exactly was and was not gonna be there because he knew that around this time, it was too late to make it to the countryside. It was too late to go and buy food. Most importantly, most importantly, Jesus knew they would be hungry, which gives them the opportunity to be their provider. So Jesus' reference to, you give them something to eat, <laughs> was that not only did Jesus want his disciples to receive, but he also calls them to be givers. See, Jesus not only calls his disciples to receive, but also to give. And Jesus not only wanted his disciples to witness the miracle, but man, to be a part of the miracle. How cool, how humbling, what an amazing opportunity it is to be a part of God's provision and be able to see and witness that and have a place in that. God invites them to be a part of the provision. God invites them to be a part of the miracle. <laughs> So throughout this passage, we've, as we've seen, we've uncovered what God does. He feeds the 5,000, what he calls the disciples to do, not just to receive, but to give, not just to witness, but to be a part of the blessing. So now we come to the question, and this is the question that really, that really brings out the intention of the disciples carefully and intentionally are accompanied, accompany Jesus in this journey. The question is, who does Jesus reveal himself as? So we've uncovered what he's done, what he calls the disciples to do, but who does Jesus reveal himself as? And before we get into that, just briefly, just, I just want to read Ezekiel 34 to you guys. And we're going to read verses one through five. And I just, want to, I just want to read this because this is going to help us uncover who Jesus, reveal himself, who Jesus reveals himself as in this passage. So Ezekiel 34 verses one through five say, the word of the Lord came to me. Son of man, prophesy against the shepherds of Israel. Prophesy and say to them, this is what the sovereign Lord says. Woe to you, shepherds of Israel, who only take care of yourselves. Should not shepherds take care of the flock? You eat the curds, clothe yourselves with the wool, and slaughter the choice of animals, but you do not take care of the flock. You have not strengthened the weak or healed the sick or bound up the injured and you have not brought back the strays or searched for the lost. So they were scattered because there was no shepherd. And when they scattered, they became food for all the wild animals. Shame on you, he says to, the, to the, these, these shepherds, that you only take care of yourselves. You have been entrusted with the flock. You have been entrusted with this specific group. And not only are they lost, but now they've become open season for animals that have been waiting to devour them because they know that these sheep cannot fend for themselves. You see, these sheep, sheep were created to be led by a shepherd because they cannot lead themselves because they've never been taught that. That's not in their nature. They, they, they only follow the voice that they recognize. They only follow the voice that they've built a relationship with. And it takes a shepherd to defend, pe to defend sheep that cannot defend themselves. But, this, but these, these uh, shepherds have been entrusted with these people 
but they've only cared for themselves. And not only that, now the flock is missing and it's open season. <laughs> for whoever sees them, I'm just gonna, who knows what happens to them. And then we come across Numbers 27, verse 17, and it says, to go out and come in before them, one who will lead them out and bring them in so the Lord's people will not be like sheep without a shepherd. Who's that person? Who's the person that's gonna come in and lead them so they're not lost, so they're not blind, so they're not confused, but they, they have someone that they can trust who's going to lead them out. And it says that the Lord's people will not be like sheep without a shepherd. My question is, who is that person? And then we go back to Mark 6, and it says that when Jesus sees the crowd, he had compassion on them, for they were like sheep without a shepherd. And he began to teach them many things. Here's who Jesus reveals himself as. Jesus reveals himself as the good shepherd who tends and cares for his sheep, and he will provide. He will provide. Not an and, not an if, nor a but. If it's God's will, he will provide. And it's in those moments when we're not sure, when we're lost, when we're confused, God will show up and reveal himself as the one who knows you, who's called you, who's made you, who's formed you, and is taking you to a place that you don't even know where you're going. But it's important that we grasp and we know <laughs> that who Jesus is is the son of God and he cares for his sheep, but what he does is provide. Sometimes we, we try to identify God as just the provider, but that's not, that's not who he is. That's what he does. Who Jesus is is the son of God who was sent here to die on the cross for our sins. You see, he gave us a life that we couldn't earn or deserve, but he was willing to risk it all and pay it all so you and I wouldn't have to. So then here we are on verse 45 to the end of this chapter. Jesus sends the disciples out and he stays and dismisses the crowd. And then after the crowd has been dismissed, he goes and he spends time with the Father in prayer. Coming back, in this, coming back from his time with the Father, he sees his disciples from a distance and he sees them struggling because the wind is against them. So Jesus begins to walk on water. He begins to walk towards them. He begins to walk towards them. And his intentions were to pass by them to see if they would recognize him and they would cry out to him. Sure enough, the disciples see him, but they don't recognize him. But it still says that they cried out. And when they cried out, it's when Jesus showed up and he said, it is I, do not be afraid. Take heart. He gets into the boat. And the Bible says that all was still. What was up here is now still because of the authority that Jesus carries. So as Jesus gets into the boat and all is still, it says that the disciples were completely amazed, but they did not understand because their hearts were hardened. The disciples did not understand because their hearts were hardened. Yo, I don't get this sometimes, man. These are people who have seen, walked, have witnessed, and have been a part of God's provision. But they don't recognize what is happening. They don't understand about the feeding because their hearts are hardened. It says that they did not understand about the feeding for their hearts were hardened. And it frustrates me. And it frustrates me because how is it that we're so, how is it that they're so quick to forget about what God just provided when they find themselves in a new storm, in a new situation, in a new circumstance, in a new problem, that they forget about what Jesus just did not even, not even a day ago, it was hours ago. How are they so quick to forget that? You see, my, 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 my natural response would be shame on them. But I also don't blame them. Because I too find myself in muddy situations where the last person I even think about or consider is God because I try to solve the problem by myself. 
I try to figure it out. I try to try to do this, try to do that, that because I'm so easy to forget about what he's done and who he is, I find myself just stirring myself, stirring myself more into the pot when the solution is the person who's led me out of a, 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 a recent problem, a recent scenario, a recent circumstance. And I don't blame them. I don't blame them. And here's what else I, I can admit. <laughs> that I recently found myself in a muddy situation that the last person I thought about or invited was Jesus. I decided to sit in my feelings and just try to figure it out on my own. When I'm not called to worry about tomorrow, I'm called to worry about right now and invite Jesus into that. But because I know myself and I know that I am imperfect and, I'm, and I fall and make mistakes every single day, that I too am quick to forget about God's provision when I find myself in a problem. And maybe some of you are in this boat right now. And I'm almost done here. I'm almost done here. Maybe some of you are in this boat right now where, man, COVID has hit some of you really hard. Some of you find yourselves hurting emotionally, physically, mentally, or even spiritually, where we're so quick to forget about what God has just recently done in our lives. Maybe this was the year somebody gave you a 2020 vision word, that everything is going to be seen clearly, that you're on fire for God, you're excited for what he's going to do. And then March comes, and we're in August, and now we're enforced to stay in our home and can only have interactions with people that we live with. But God, what about me? I live on my own. But God, what about me? I just spent the, the past 15 years building this business, and now I can't even open it because we're on a, we're on a restrict and a, and a strict said thing that says that we have to close down. How am I going to provide for my family? How am I going to provide for my newborn baby? How am I going to provide for myself? God, how, how am I going to get myself out of this situation? So because of COVID, I too find myself in a situation where school is going online and it's not a guarantee that you get to stay on campus. <laughs> and man, when I found out the school was going fully online, I said, Look, Matt, you guys better pray for me. I cannot do school online. And I found myself so worried about the situation. I found myself just, uh, uh, what I do, what I do, what I do. And then sure enough, this summer, I have been staying at the community house with both uh, Max and Kimberly Churn and their amazing kids and everyone else there. And as I'm in, in the living room, just kind of processing, what am I going to do? Kimberly Churn walks into the door and I begin to, to share and just rant what's going on. And she says, isn't it so funny that this Sunday, that in a couple of weeks or a few days, you're talking about putting our trust in God, putting our hope in God and knowing that he's the provider when we find ourselves in unbelief. But yet here you are in unbelief and you're thinking, responding, and acting in unbelief and not in faith. <laughs> and I can admit that, and I can accept that, and I can receive that. That when I find myself in a situation or in a circumstance, I'm so quick to, to come from a place and think from a place of unbelief and not of faith. I'm so easy. I'm so quick to forget about who God has been in my life and what he's done in my life. And before I, I just want to give you guys an opportunity to just respond. But before we get into that, I just uh, wanted to share a word that was given to me that I believe is appropriate and accurate for this time. And the word was that we, as God's children, are coming before the Father. And we're sitting on his lap. And man, he embraces us and he comforts us. And we don't worry about a single thing, but yet we, we don't worry about anything but knowing <laughs> that he knows what he's going to do. And he knows what he has to do. And we just got to trust him in that season. And as I found myself, as I, as I received this word... I just, I knew that there's some of us here today, man, that have been walking with the Lord for a long time. 
And then somewhere along your path, you have turned a different direction or have found something else and you've been wanting to come back to Jesus. But it's been hard to, to, to do that because there's so much shame and guilt. And maybe this is your first time here or online and you're, if you're watching online and you, and you just found this page and you're, and you're trying to, to, to grasp what is happening and you feel something tugging your heart, can I just say, that's God. That's Jesus knocking at the door of your heart saying, let me in. Man, I, what I have for you has already been prepared and is laid out for you. Man, can I just say, Jesus loves you and he sees you so much and he cares about you. Okay, and bring those problems, bring those solutions, bring the problems, bring the circumstances, bring whatever you're facing before Jesus and allow him to do what he does. Because my encouragement for you, church, is that Jesus is real and he will provide. And in a moment, I want to give us an opportunity to respond. But I want us to respond in faith. You see, I want us to act out in faith and believe, God, I believe this and I believe what is happening. I believe that you are the provider. I believe that you're the shepherd and I believe that you care. So this is me in my response. This is us in our response saying, God, I'm all in and I want you in my heart. So in the count of three, if you're here and you either want to come back to Jesus or give your life to Jesus, I'm gonna encourage you to either honk and if your horn doesn't work, then turn on your flashers. And if your flashers don't work, man, raise your hand. And if you're watching online, I just, if you either want to re-give or give your life to Jesus, I just want you to comment yes or, or send a hand emoji. And this isn't so we can go and boast about how many people responded. This is so we can see it, we can affirm it, and we can celebrate you. Because you've made one of the most important decisions of your life. Where you no longer worry about the doors that have been closed, but you'll be able to come to realize that the doors that have been closed happen so that the so that this door can open, a door to truth, a door to a relationship, man, a door that is found to um, a door that is found to have a life in Jesus, a door where all your fears are, and all the fears and everything that you're struggling with is no longer something for you to worry about. It, but it's to bring before Jesus, and He comes to the door and He greets you and He will welcome you, and, he, and you will be accepted. So with that. This is your moment, okay? I understand that maybe you've been hurt by a lot of people and it's hard to trust and you have trust issues and it's hard to come back. Or maybe you're a lot like me where you necessarily haven't been hurt by a lot of people, but you've hurt a lot of people and you can't seem to find peace and acceptance and love in your heart because all you think about is the people that you've hurt with your words, with your actions, with what you do. But can I just say the same 16 year old boy that uncovered the, the heart of Jesus and, and, and someone said, Jesus loves you and that he has grace for you and he, wa and he wants a life with you. And I said, yes. And my encouragement is if you're here, don't leave without saying yes. So with that, one, on the count of three, this is your chance to respond. And one, the Bible tells us that for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son and that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. And two, the Bible tells us if you believe in your hearts and confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, man, you will be saved. And three, Jesus loves you, man. Jesus loves you. And whether you said yes online or you said yes here, like God sees that and he honors that. So Father, I just thank you, Lord, for this time. Lord, I thank you for who you are and who you've revealed yourself to us as, Lord. Father, I, I pray for the hearts that have listened, Lord. I pray for the hearts, Lord, that have said yes, Lord. I also pray for the people, Lord, who have switched the, 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 their focus and have chosen to entrust you, Lord. I thank you for their lives and I thank you for their hearts. And Jesus, we give you all the praise and all the glory in advance, Father. We say yes to your promise. We say yes to your word. And we say yes to trusting that you are the shepherd who will provide. In your holy name, we all pray and say, amen.